Hello and a warm welcome to this week's edition of Invest Africa. I'm Alicia Second. Leaders from the BRICS countries gathered at the coastal city of Durban, South Africa for the fifth BRICS summit this week. The outcomes and scheduled meetings between the BRICS group of countries will have a critical role in defining the future of developing economies. Let's take a look. BRICS, which before the inclusion of South Africa in 2010, was originally known as BRIC. The bloc represents an association of emerging national economies, namely Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. With the possible exception of Russia, the BRICS members are all developing or newly industrialized countries, but they are distinguished by their large, fast-growing economies and significant influence on regional and global affairs. As of 2013, the five BRICS countries represent almost 3 billion people, account for 19% of world GDP and 61% of overall global growth. This also explains why BRICS has attracted so much attention. BRICS has also put development high on the agenda. In recent years, it has extended its coverage of different fields to trade, banking, taxation, customs, agriculture and culture. In 2012, a BRICS development bank was put on the table. Once established, it will serve as a stimulus to development in BRICS members, as well as in other emerging and developing countries. A BRICS joint reserve pool and a business council are also under discussion, which are expected to forge closer financial and trade ties among members. However, there have been analysts that have highlighted potential divisions and weaknesses in the group, such as in India and China's agreements over the territorial issues and disputes between the members over UN Security Council reform. South Africa's role as a member of BRICS has also had mixed reviews, especially regarding what value the country can bring to the bloc. The BRICS are going to be a very powerful force driving corporate transactions, driving economic growth and development in the world going forward. And China is very much the springboard of the BRICS. When you look at the BRICS, half of the GDP is represented by China and they are the fastest growing uh, and for demographic, for demographically most powerful group within the BRICS. Uh, but for the balance, you know, South Africa, Africa within that is going to play an important role. And the China-Africa relationship and the relationship between Africa and these other countries is very, very important to the development of the continent. But globally, in terms of economic growth, the incremental growth that comes from the BRICS is going to dominate the next half century. According to the IMF, in 2012, South Africa's GDP growth was revised from 3.2% to about 27 for the year. Comparatively, the rest of Africa was expected to grow an average of about 7% over the short to medium term. China and India, on the other hand, are expected to power ahead with between 7 and 10% growth. This has further raised questions about South Africa's position as a springboard into Africa. South Africa has realized that in order to go forward from an economic perspective, from a business perspective, and definitely from a political perspective, there needs to be a, a lot more regionalization and cooperation at a regional level. Joining me at the desk to analyze and contextualize the fifth BRICS summit in Durban is Dennis Dykes. He's chief economist at the Nedbank Group, Chris Hart, who's a chief strategist at Investment Solutions as well. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining me today. Let's get straight into it. Chris, we've got the fifth BRICS summit in Durban having taken place this week. The theme, BRICS and Africa, partnerships for integration and industrialization. At the top, what's your opinion on us looking more so at a political grouping here as a opposed to an economic one? Well, as I said, it started off as a political grouping, and in fact, this, is, this particular summit, I think, is trying to find some economic and business relevance to the actual political grouping. Uh, it's, it's a difficult grouping, in fact, to find some common overlapping uh, mutual interests, because to a large extent, many of the, the, the strategic interests of, of the different BRICS countries are, in fact, quite disparate in, in, in the sense of South Africa and, and Brazil. We're actually competitors in, in, a, in a sense to try and put, put uh, raw materials in, into China. Uh, China itself is, uh, is a controversial one in the sense uh, from an industrialization point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, China certainly has been sucking industry away from the rest of the world into itself and, um, and flooding the world with cheap goods. And, uh, and, and that's, of course, a concern of uh, other 
uh, partner countries and uh, you know in the BRICS grouping and Russia would be included in there but certainly South Africa very concerning about our own in industrial growth uh, which has really been languishing over the last few years so this this particular conference I think tries to at least glue something together from an economic interest point of view. For now though, what we are looking at uh, to a large extent is a political grouping and uh, Dennis, it's an important premise to establish where conversation has been time and time again that South Africa uh, specifically is the smallest brick in the wall with very little clout and uh, you know, highlighting that we're looking at uh, huge economic disparities between these five members themselves. How much does that matter? Because surely if we're looking more so at a political grouping, and size doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's actually quite good that you can be a, a, a member of a, a group of countries that um, uh, really assume much bigger sort of political importance on, in the world, on the world agenda. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and yet, yeah, we actually have a seat at the table. We've actually got a voice. So I think it is something which uh, we've got to look at on, on fairly favorably from a political point of view. Um, and it does mean that Africa's voice, which is often not heard, is being heard at least in one other, one other forum. So, um, so I think from that aspect, it's very, very favourable. I mean, we are the minnow from an uh, economic point of view. Uh, our GDP uh, is uh, roughly 0.7 percent of, of G world GDP, and uh, China is, depending on which measure you use, mm -hmm. but on the so-called purchasing power parity measure, is about 15 percent. So, um, you can see immediately that there's a huge disparity there, but. Um, but even between Russia and China, uh, Russia is about 3%, Brazil is about 3%. Those are fairly small economies compared to China. And India, of course, is, is relatively big as well yeah. uh, compared yeah. to the, the Russias and the, and the Brazils. Yeah. However, South Africa's economy in relation to Africa is big. Exactly. Mm. And right. that is and where the appeal lies it, it, for the exactly. most part. Exactly. I, I think ultimately as a political grouping, um, it's going to, the BRICS is going to expand to include the likes of Nigeria, Indonesia, maybe Mexico and Vietnam. You know, those, those kind of countries which have also got fairly large populations and are, are emerging and, and that, that, that would make sense is that this is rather counterbalanced to the type of G7. That's the emerging market mm -hmm. equivalent of the G7 as it were. And I'm, I'm sure at some stage these other, other countries may also be included if if this grouping has legs in any case, you know, to actually last a distance, in other yeah. words, does it find relevance in itself and also on the global stage? We had Chris uh, highlighting earlier, Dennis, that with these emerging markets being, uh, you know, competitors with each other and to an extent being protectionist of their own economy, uh, there may be a challenge in establishing uh, a united voice, uh, you know, where we're looking at these partnerships of integration. Mm. To what extent is that a concern for you? Well, look, um, if you're talking about trade zones, then it, it, those sort of issues become quite important. Although, ironically, economists look at things differently to the industrialists. Um, mm -hmm. Ironically, uh, when you're looking at it from an economic, an economic perspective, you actually want countries of a similar sort of structure mm -hmm. so that you increase competitiveness between those countries. So industrialists are competing against, and that forces the efficiencies and drives down prices. Um, I mean, it could be worse for China could be flooding the world with expensive goods, but we actually at least <laughs> getting the benefit. Always <laughs> look at the glass half full here. <laughs> I think, well, I think it's actually tremendous that there are people out there willing to work uh, so hard for so little. I mean, and, and uh, you know, obviously the challenge for us is to find our niche within that. Uh, and in that sense, South Africa is actually in quite a good position because we don't have to actually become dominant in any world um, market. Mm -hmm. We can found our niches and we can actually compete. Um, to leverage off uh, you know, relationships though, uh, some saying, Chris, that it may be easier uh, to do with some as opposed to, uh, to others. I mean, maybe India, a better partner for South Africa, uh, having been a British colony in the past, not yeah. wanting to be under dominance again and not wanting to play the role of a colonizer either. So coming exactly. into a relationship with a very different person perspective yeah. with Africa to the likes of a China, for example. No, exactly. I think uh, I, I certainly agree that, that India is probably a better long-term partner. They don't, uh, as I said, people are suspicious about the long-term global ambitions and global reach that China could have. Uh, India doesn't have those aspirations, certainly not yet. And Brazil is still quite introspective and um, 
it's, uh, and Russia is a little bit of a mystery in a sense, uh, certainly from the perspective of South Africa. You, you know, looking across there, there, there is a problem of perception of corruption there, mm -hmm. where South Africa, where we're complaining about it, we are very, very clean, you know, compared to the measures that you look at when it comes to, 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 to Russia. Um, and these are things that need to be cleaned up. Funny enough, all of these measures, the BRICS don't measure well on things like um, competitiveness and um, uh, ease of doing business and that type of thing. South Africa is one of the, um, uh, how could you say, one of the more favorable countries. They actually, S South Africa from a number of measures actually scores better than China, India, Brazil and Russia. Um, in, in many instances, and this is where I think we can actually leverage some some advantage. We just don't realize that being a small country, we have to try harder. We, we can't just be comparable. We actually have to try harder to actually attract investment yeah. uh, and, and, and business. But, but we, we are in many ways in a very, very favorable position. In that context, let's take a look at some of the conversations that are happening. Prominent in the pre-summit discussions had been uh, the establishment of this BRICS development bank. Viability in your books of something like this, a mechanism like this coming to the fore? Well, uh, you know, my, my own feeling on that is that m maybe it would have been better to have some sort of coordinating um, body that actually worked with the different development banks in each of the different regions where, I mean, we've got uh, whole layers of development banks. This will be an additional one. But I think it's very important to realize that um, the BRICS development bank is going to be set up almost a, in opposition to a World mm -hmm. Bank. Um, so, again, there's a very political dimension to it. But uh, ultimately, it depends on how it's actually constituted. Because uh, you know, if everyone throws in the ten billion dollars worth of capital, um, you know, that's not a huge bank. Uh, it does have extremely limited resources, but and yet it would actually stretch us. I mean, that's so exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, even so uh, with that price tag being yeah. uh, so small, relatively speaking, mm. bottom line, can South Africa? pay that price? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it comes at a problematic time. Obviously, we've had ratings downgrades. Um, we are somewhat cash strapped if you look mm -hmm. at our current account deficit um, and you look at our, our fiscal um, deficit. So it's not an ideal time for that. Um, I, the ideal thing would, of course, be to follow a similar sort of model to World Bank IMF, where people actually have quotas that are represent the similar size of the economy so that they're able to actually do that. Well ultimately we may well see things boil down to that in itself and mm -hmm. therein lies the risk of uh, you know things getting naturally skewed here. To yeah. what extent do we price in that risk you know with yeah. the economic <coughs> might possibly leading to that skewed influence because contribution to the bank and the distribution of that associated risk uh, would vary and in so doing uh, you know the inf uh, influence on the funds decision making mm. comes comes to light. No exactly but I think so they're starting the bank off with all the member states on an equal footing. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, helps to bed down the problem that you'd have of maybe Chinese dominance in that kind of fund. Um, so in a sense, instead of getting financed directly from China with the fears of neocolonialism, as, as people would call it, etc., um, you've now got a fund that's more, um, th th that doesn't have, how could you say, political dominance um, ambitions, and certainly not initially. And, um, and so you may well find that, that countries in Africa accessing that d developing development finance may find it more palatable than, than getting it directly from China or India or Brazil yeah. directly, or even the, the World Bank and, I and IMF. It gives an, it gives an alternative. Where I think could be very interesting, it, it will be again be a political creation, but it will create an economic hub, as it were, where you start gaining greater business relevance to the BRICS concept. The big thing is, do the politics stretch to actually then use a currency other than the dollar in time to come? And that would be interesting because that's where the actual real competition with the World Bank and IMF could come. While those conversations happen, we also have to ask the question, Dennis, do we stand the risk of alienating ourselves uh, from uh, you know, those multilateral development banks, notably a player like the World Bank, uh, developed nations as well, and then other emerging market peers as well? Um, there, there is that danger. Uh, you know, I, my personal view is that um, it really depends how actually it is 
constituted. constituted. Um, uh, you know, clearly you can actually have even unequal capital contributions, but you can have equal voting rights. It doesn't have to be exactly the way that the World no, Bank exactly. is put together. You know, so uh, so you can get around all those sort of issues, and that's why I said it's very important that it plays almost like a coordinating role between existing, like for example, the African Development Bank, our own Development Bank, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so that. Um, so that you're not excluding, but you add in two, and add in the firepower, the, the capital raising power of, of uh, those institutions. And then it could work very, very well. M my sense is though, instead of alienating the IMF and World Bank, they may actually have to work harder for their own relevance um, in, in that view. But it, it's going to be interesting, it's another ball thrown mm -hmm. into the game, and how the game develops is going to be actually quite interesting. But these are countries that can stand on their own feet that can't be bombed and they can't be invaded and that sort of thing easily at, 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 at all so uh, I, I, I don't th it, it does help to rebalance a single polar world into a more multipolar mm. yeah. polar world I mean, at this point it would be very symbolic mm. because uh, the amount of capital has got versus a world bank is is you know extremely tiny if they mm. if they're going mm. ahead in this sort of basis so you know I don't think the world bank's going to be intimidated but it's really sending a political yeah. message. message and the, the political message is really that, um, that China in particular and Russia would like to have more say in the World Bank's affairs. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's almost like a, a little bit of a bargaining chip as far as they're concerned. They're willing to pay the price of putting additional capital in. Um, and we, we would be the beneficiaries along with the rest of Africa, providing, as, we, as I say, the rules are set up correctly. Absolutely. I mean, where you talk about the symbolism uh, coming through there, uh, the fact that if we do look at uh, different uh, countries uh, paying uh, a different entry fee in terms of you know funding this bank as a whole uh, South Africa m uh, may not uh, you know contribute to that some of the commentary mm. has been but ultimately we'd see this organization financed by other members specifically uh, China and then mm. setting up the bank with a home base in South Africa would mm -hmm. be symbolic as well symbolic yeah. but also uh, coming with a lot of benefits for yeah. the BRIC members so by setting up in South Africa you've got the BRICS members uh, gaining access to the regional grouping that mm. is SADEX, I mean, that makes up what, what 15 countries. It's yeah. a GDP total of $575 billion, and it's that's certainly nothing to scoff at. Exactly, and I think, you know, people said it's BRICS with the smallest, but if you said it's actually Southern Africa, where we, we are proxy, pro, uh, proxy for SADEX or Southern Africa, is that it's, uh, we've got the population to go with it and the economic growth uh, overall in the region is certainly... Um, yeah certainly something there. South Africa obviously needs to up its game as far as invest, you know, its own growth rate is concerned. Um, but uh, in terms of, th there's, there's other issues I think like corporate governance for instance, mm -hmm. much better located in South Africa than would be in um, in China, India or Brazil. Well, or let's Russia. hit pause on the conversation for now because while it certainly is uh, difficult at this stage for many to justify South Africa's inclusion into the BRIC acronym from an economic perspective, uh, certainly the country remains the most developed of uh, sub-Saharan Africa uh, as a whole and in this regard it uh, can be seen as the continent's representative on this, uh, this body. Uh, we'll have to take a sh quick commercial break right now but when we come back we get the views from Global Credit Rating on on BRICS, stay tuned because uh, we put the focus on the BRICS relationship with Africa specifically.